The car that you see here is one of my favorite cars of all time. It is the Lexus LC500. It's a fairly unknown car, especially here in Germany. I've never seen another one on the roads, but it has received pretty good reviews. I mean, people praise the exterior, the interior is gorgeous, and it sounds really well when you're driving it because it has this big, old, naturally aspirated V8 engine. But the car also has an Achilles heel. The one feature that everybody unanimously agree is really, really bad to the extent that sometimes they can't even recommend this car. And that is, of course, the infamous Lexus infotainment system, and in particular, the touchpad controller. In this video, I'm going to show you in painful detail all of the small failings of both the controller, how you input things to the whole menu system, how it's a mix of different styles that don't really mesh together and how this overall just gives us a really, really bad user experience. Let's start by turning on the car and then you can see what's going on. And the first thing that you'll notice is that we have these intro sequences, both in the gate cluster and over here. Now the big problem is that if I want to go somewhere and I press the nav button, it takes a little time to pop up. And if I want to say a destination, I still have to wait until it loads into the system. And that takes a little while. So if you are planning on just leaving, oh, here we go, home. Zuhause. Tut mir leid, die Navigation ist nicht bereit. Bitte warten Sie einen Moment. It tells me that the system is not ready yet to actually take in input for where I'm going to go. <laughs> uh, let's try again. Zu Hause. Routenführung wird gestartet. Zu Hause. Excellent. And now I can actually go home. Okay. But as you can see, it takes a little while to start up. And let's start with an overview of this whole system, starting at the touchpad controller. It controls the screen, or the cursor on the screen, and you press it down in order to make a selection. There are also some physical buttons on this controller. From the left-hand side, we have map. Always brings you to the map. We have the menu button in the middle. It always brings you to the menu. And we have the back button. Most of the time, it goes Back. And we have a couple of additional buttons. We have the radio button, which brings you to uh, <laughs> the radio list. I'm never using that button. And we have the media button, which is making you select the source of the media that you want to consume. There is also one additional button, and that is the sub function button. When I press it, most of the time it just beeps at me, but it actually does have a function or a couple of functions in this system. Let me show you a couple of them. One of them is when we are going to be uh, typing in a destination. So I can choose as input device here that I want to uh, search, yeah, it's okay. And I want to search using what is called handwriting. So I can write a letter here. Danish A is difficult to recognize, but the system does it. Hand recognition actually works really well. Then I press the sub-function button in order to finish handwriting. Another use of this button is in uh, adding destinations. And I say, uh, yeah, just add to my current destination. And then you can see that I can use the sub-function button in order to confirm the selection I have out here. Now that is pretty weird because typically I'm not using the sub-function button for that. Let me instead say destination and then I go home again. Then I say replace, and then it instead of using the sub function button to confirm, it has on screen buttons. And in this case, here a red, a blue, and a green button for the route selection. And I choose one of those. That is the sub function button. As for the layout of the system itself, you can see here I'm pressing the menu button, it gives me the main menu. I'm typically only doing three things with the system, and that is using the map using it for climate controls and setup, so that is all the way here to the right. Now I typically just turn on the concierge, and I typically use a system for radio. Let's go into the issues I have with the system, and the first issue is that the system is super complicated. You're going to see how complicated it is, but Lexus knows it is complicated. In fact, there's a user manual for this car. 
The manual itself is 496 pages for the car, and then in addition to that there's 252 pages just for the navigation system. A software system like this in our day and age should be so intuitive to use that you don't need handbooks anymore. But you really need it for this system because it is so super complicated and that is just how it is. The second issue is the slow startup. An issue I have with the buttons here is that the radio and media buttons are really redundant. I never used them and the reason I don't use them is that I have buttons on the steering wheel. So if I'm going to listen to USB, Bluetooth audio and so on, I just do that from the, uh, the steering wheel. That is all I need. I can also control the station list from the steering wheel and I can control the volume. So instead of these two buttons here, I mean Lexus could have used this space for heating and cooling of the seats and the steering wheel. There's plenty of space here for those three kind of buttons. It's a shame that Lexus didn't think that it should do that instead. One thing that annoys me with the buttons they have selected to make easily available here is that there's no longer a button to skip the folder. So now I'm in the folder Initial D and listening to Initial D music because that's what you should do in this kind of car. And I can select the next song and the next song on steering wheel. I can use the track select here on the left hand side of the power button and I can use the same little squalor here on the right hand side. But there's no way of jumping to the next folder. In older Toyota models you just hold the button down and it will skip to the next folder. Here it's used to seek inside of a song. Why did they add so many redundancies for next song and not next folder? I do not know. It's really annoying. And in order to go to the next folder I have to go out here. I have to say browse. I have to say folders and then I have to choose my next folder here and that's super annoying. I do not think there should be a sub function button in this system. It is used extremely rarely and when it is used it is confusing to use. As an example here I have the stopover list. I cannot go down to click go. It doesn't allow me to do that. Instead I really have to press that physical button and if you're not used to seeing or using that function, you might not even know it is there. And then you get confused by this screen because you can't go down and say, go, go, go. That is super annoying. And the other usages, there's only really one good implementation of it, and that is with the handwriting. But come on, you could also have implemented this in another way. Or even better, you could not have handwriting in this system because who is ever going to be handwriting letters here? I mean, Come on, it's much easier to just use keyboard input, even though the keyboard input is terrible. But that's another point on my list. One of the big issues with this system is that it is extremely slow. I press the menu button and I wait and now it's giving me the menu. Let's go back again. Now it should be in memory, so if I click the menu button it should come immediately, right? So menu and there it comes. Click the map button, that's a bit quicker, but a lot of the buttons that you can press are also slow with popping up. And it should be much quicker than what we have in the system. Overall it just means that the user experience is not as nice because you have to wait for a laggy system. And it is especially bad when you are doing stuff like zooming. I want to zoom out, whoop, and there we go not super responsive. One of the biggest issues with the trackpad itself is how you can configure it. So if I go here in the system setup, general, and then I go down, then you can see what I can actually do in order to modify the system and how I'm in interacting with it. It has a pointer sound volume. So yeah, I can change the volume, that's great. Now, what do you think I have to do in order to go back, by the way? Do I have to click the back button or do something else? Well, let's see what happens if I click the back button. Welcome to the map screen. Okay, um, <laughs> that's not what I wanted. So let's go back to the setup. And we're not even back yet. And <laughs> now we are back. Nope, because what you saw right now was not a sub menu. It was an expansion of the menu we are in. So if I go up now, now we are back. So ha, that, that is not really shown very nicely. So what is really missing here is a forward button. So when you accidentally click back, then you can easily get back back, get forward again. 
and that is missing from this system because we have these map and menu button ideally oh no we have a traffic announcement cancel i don't want to hear it okay <laughs> cancel doesn't cancel it just cancels the message on the screen so again it's not super intuitive what is happening with the system so where were we selection sound is something i can turn on and off i can set pointer sound on and off so now it doesn't give me the sound ideally i would want instead of just pointer sound on and off i want to have a shorter pointer sound because that would make it feel more precise to use error sound it's a uh, so it's an error when I'm pressing the sub function button, so that should not give a sound now, right? Well, it still does. Okay, so that's not so useful. Feedback force. Now this is almost comical. It's at one right now. That means I do get tactile feedback here when I'm moving around and having different selections. That is really nice. I would like to have a shorter tactile feedback because that would make it feel more precise. Instead, I have the force feedback. So right now, it's on one. If I put my little Lego figure here and put it on three, you can see he's moving around quite a bit because this is a ridiculous amount of feedback force. Let me put it back in one and you can see this is much more comfortable for him. This is the only really way that you can change how the cursor interacts. So I have cursor speed fast because I find it because I find it convenient to easily get to the other side of the screen. Now, you can put it on slow and that makes it more precise to use the system. However, now it's also less convenient because now it takes longer time to get from one side of the screen to another. Let me just show you. Going on the fast right now, go to the map and you can see moving from one side to the other, I get all the way to the other side. If I go on slow, let me go into the setup again. Then I have to go down, 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 down. Because the speed is slow. Back to the map. Then you can see moving from one side quickly to the other. Doesn't move me all the way across the map, but it's more precise now. However, what we are missing in this system is what is called pointer acceleration. There's no way of being both precise and convenient with the setup. Right now it's on slow, which means it's as precise as possible, but it's inconvenient because I have to lift my finger quite often in order to move the pointer around. On a normal touchpad system, like on any kind of laptop with Windows or Mac OS, you will see that you typically have pointer acceleration enabled on trackpads. Some people turn it off for the mouse when they are gaming, but typically you want it on with a trackpad because that means that when you're moving quickly here on on the trackpad the pointer should move more and that is not an option here and that's what makes it inconvenient one of my biggest issues with the system is that i have often misclicked so i'm driving the car and then when i'm clicking these buttons over here i often click the wrong one and there's a good reason for that let me show you how it should have been implemented because that's also in the system if i go to the climate options then you can see this screen here but even better if i go to the seat steering and heating screen Notice how when I go in here and then go between the buttons, they are sticky. What I mean by that is once I am going into a selection here and then go back, it takes a while before I actually get back. Even though I should be at the edge between two buttons, they are sticking or they are forcing the actual cursor into the center so that it's very convenient for me. I hear the feedback and I know that a button has been selected. When you go to the map screen, to the map screen, there we go. These buttons here on the left hand side are not sticky. See, here's my cursor. I go down here, I go out again. I'm still down here, which means that if I go a little bit down, I'm suddenly on the other button. What this means is that when I'm driving the car and I'm selecting a button over here, I can't see the cursor because it disappears behind the button. So that's an issue for itself. Another issue is, I don't know where it is, the cursor. And that means that when I'm pressing down or making a selection, there's a big risk that I'm suddenly selecting another button before I'm actually pressing. And that's especially a problem when driving. But you can also see that it's a problem because of how a finger works. <laughs> I mean, right now, 
I'm on this top button. I click down and you see it jumps to the button below. Why does it do that? Well, because the problem is that when you're pressing a surface, you're not just pressing in one point. Your finger actually expands as you're pressing down or the surface that you're pressing with is expanding as you're pressing down. That means when I'm pressing here on the touchpad, I risk that expansion is making another button selected. And that's such an obvious issue. And that is why you don't make sticky buttons, or that is why you make sticky buttons and not non-sticky buttons as you see right here. And that is why Lexus did it in one place, but then kind of forgot about it when they got over here. That's really annoying. This system, when it came out, was advertised as being multi-touch. And it is multi-touch because you have zoom. Pinch, zoom, pinch out. This is the only multi-touch thing in this whole system. There's nothing else. You can't do three finger going to the main menu thing like on a Mac. You can't go to a list and be like, oh, I want to scroll through a list. Let's just go to the setup. Here we have a list. Okay, what happens when I use two fingers in order to scroll the list instead of just up and down on screen? Nothing. Why does nothing happen? Because Lexus didn't think that they should do like everybody else and implement proper multi-touch gestures. This is the only other gesture there is, and that is the flick. I flick up and down on this list in order to scroll through the list instead of using two fingers like I'm used to in any other system. And there's no other gesture, so I can't flick to the left and right hand side in order to flip through menus or subsystems, like any kind of fun with that. Nope. And to make it even worse, this is not consistent. Of course, it's not consistent with the flick. This is a list, right? Just like the list we saw before, right? Nope. This list does not use the flick command. For some reason, every other list in the system does, not this one. Why? I don't know. I don't know. One thing that you do see when you're having list is that they have scroll bars. So that is the thing over here to the right hand side. And that is a very old UI element to show where you are in a bigger list. And you can scroll using very precise maneuvering going to the buttons and then we go up and down and we even have wrap around. That is nice, but it's really difficult to actually hit these small buttons when driving. You really have to focus on the system. You can also grab this thing here in the middle, click on that. And now we are stuck in this scrolling thing here and we can't get out just by going to the sides. Nope, you are staying with me in this. So it really hijacks control when you're doing this. And then you have to click on it again in order to get out. Not using the sub function button like we had a selection with elsewhere, but that is how these scroll things work. There should not be scroll panes in here. That should at most just be indicating where you are in a bigger list. You should not be able to select this. You should not have these tiny buttons that you can press. That is stupid that we have that, even that option. What we should have instead is two fingers up and down to scroll up and down a list. That is it. Because that would be the modern way of interacting with a list and they should have made it consistent in the system. But they did not because they lack confidence in what they have implemented and that really shows and it shows elsewhere as well. So the lack of confidence also really shows here on, uh, on the zooming on the map, right? Because of course you can pinch to zoom, but it's too slow. What you will do instead is maybe use these plus and minus over here in the left hand side. Or maybe you'll click here and then have it hijack you just like you saw before. And again, it just shows you redundancy because they lack confidence in what they have implemented. But there is a nice, what is called an Easter egg here. See if you scroll all the way out, you see the world. I think this is pretty cute. And yeah, it's at least it has that, right? It's what can I say? Lack of confidence in your implementation. Where am I? How, how do I get out? What's happening now? Did I kill the system? Seriously, did I? Oh, come on. Okay, so this has happened before. <laughs> I just have to wait a little bit, right? I just have to. Okay, I'm out. I'm back. I'm back. Okay, good. One of the bigger issues with the system is how convoluted it is and how many 
buttons are unlabeled and rarely used. As an example, now I want to go to work, right? I want to search for an echo route instead. And you saw I could do that when I selected the the destination, favorite, I'm going to work. Let's have work that it does. The place, and now I can choose in a second I can, it's the same route as before. I can choose short, echo and fast. Let's say I go fast because I have a Lexus LC500. But then, oh, fuel prices are high. Now I want to go the echo route. How do I get to there? I go to three dots, of course. And then I go to right routes. And then I get this unlabeled button here and say, uh, okay, these unlabeled buttons and click on this little flower because now it's echo <laughs> why why is this button unlabeled what is happening here i don't nobody knows what these what is this this is shortest route why does it show arrows going out instead of in when you want shortest route see now shortest route the icon is wrong and <laughs> this is fastest route yeah of course these buttons need labels and even worse or even more importantly, these buttons here in particular need to be of the same design as when I selected my route in the first place. They need the colors, they need to be consistent with what I had. So remember, this is what the buttons look like now. And when I search for the route, the buttons for work, replace, the buttons I can get to choose here are not the same. See? There's no little guy running. There's, we have colors instead. And that is, why is it so inconsistent? I do not know. And why are there so many levels? And why do we have features like this? Check this out. Weather at destination. Online connection cannot be established. Oh, I don't know why. Why can it show me the weather at destination? I don't need that feature. No one needs that feature. I'm already, <laughs> I, I'm already dressed. I cannot change what I'm wearing if the weather at destination is different from what I'm expecting. And also, is it weather at destination now or when I'm arriving? And there's, there's just so many features here that you should never use. I know there are some features in old Toyota systems that have been removed, which were even worse than what you see here. But come on, why does this car have a DVD player? Let's address one of the... Uh, things that many car reviewers have brought up and that is heated and cooled seats. It is very difficult to get to that. I mentioned before it would be really nice if we had physical buttons for it here instead of radio and media they could be replaced. We don't have that. What do we have to do instead? Well click on menu, go to climate, then over here seat and steering and now we can go in and turn on heated and cooled seats and this is really weird. So I want to just turn a little bit on for seat cooling. I go a little bit up and it goes full power. Now I go, in order to get down again, I have to go down, down, down. Why? And if I go down, it goes only a little bit up. But now if I go up, it goes up. It's, that's really weird. It's like it's turning on in the wrong direction. And the same with the steering. I turn up, it goes full power, okay, half power and off. And if I go down, it goes a little bit up and then I can go up. up. It's so strange. And the same, of course, with uh, seat heating. If I go down, it goes up. And if I go down, it goes down. If I go up, it goes full power. And then if I go down, it goes actual down. It's completely inconsistent with itself. I don't know why they did it like this. They did, and it's just... a curious strange implementation of this but it's this the, there's too many button presses in order to get here and that really annoys car reviewers it annoys me you can get around it though because on the right hand side we do have so let's go to the uh, typically you look at the map on the right hand side you can choose other screens i can choose to have additional map information Whoops. I can also choose to have music information over here and I can choose to have trip information. I don't really care about that, but of course I can have climate information. And here I can choose, this is uh, normal temperature, 
stuff. But even more importantly, I can just have this on the right hand side of my, let's just say continue this time. I, do, I think continue and cancel does the exact same <laughs> when clicking on that pop up. Okay, but back to the uh, seat and steering stuff. I can have this option on the right hand side. And that gives me a quick uh, access to heated and cooled seats. So you can have a quick access like this. One thing about the main menu is that you can choose the different subsystems in here. But check this out. For the climates, I have shortcuts from the main menu if I go into climate. So you're going to see seat steering, concierge and options if I click on the climate button here. Da -da, they are here. Okay. Now, what about the other buttons? As an example, for setup, my shortcut is display. But if I go into setup, where is display here? It is actually not on the menu on the left. I have to get into a list option here in order to get to it. So it's a shortcut over two levels where before we had shortcut over just one level and that's really really weird that they have made that choice that sometimes it's two levels sometimes it's one level all the time it is not customizable i can't choose which shortcuts i want and i really want to choose my own shortcuts so now we have seen a lot of issues with menus and so on let's do something fundamental with the navigation system and that is to input where you want to go. <laughs> that shouldn't be too difficult, right? Well, it has a search button where you can do free text search. And it also has this other button where you can actually put in an address. And let's just try to do that because I live in Germany. What do I do in Germany? Well, I live in towns and the town I live in now is called Fürth. F and then comes a U with an umlaut. Normal ASCII keyboards have those buttons, those keys, over here on the right hand side. If I used my old Toyota IQ, it would have a button here in order to allow me to choose the U with a umlaut. But here I have to choose that kind of input in order to change type again, go back and forth between ASCII and special characters. And the umlaut is under here, it's not under here. Because these are completely different types. And then I have to go back and forth in order to just type a city. And that is super annoying. I can't do lower and upper case though, for no obvious reason. Talking about typing stuff in, let's call someone on the phone. I have the keypad here. If I want to call Denmark, I have to say plus 45 first. Or if I want to go through some menus, typically they say type something and with pound. Now let's try to see if I can add a plus. That's a star. Slow click is star. Double click is two stars. Tri triple click. I can't get at the goddamn plus how do i get it if you hold it for very long really 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 long then it might just be nice and nope how the hell did i do this blah, 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 blah. okay plus i hold it down how long have i there it is how long did i have to hold it there Plus 45, I'm ready to type in a phone number in Denmark. That is way too long. It's illogical that it works like that. It should not take that long to press plus. And now I'm trying to do it again. And it doesn't work. Why? I do not know. Of course, typing in country code, you can also just do a double zero 45. <laughs> but the thing is, you should be able to type those letters here and you just can't because the system doesn't really work. What else is there? Well, there's apps, right? Let's do some apps. E-Store, good. Let's check out. Oh, there's no connection available right now. Set up connection. But anyway, even if there was a connection available, this wouldn't work.
because I have a Lexus LC500 from 2019 and the apps don't work. Okay, what about Android Auto? Ah, that doesn't work either. Apple CarPlay? Nope, not available. Intune, the connected services from Lexus don't work here, so no 10 years free subscription like you get in America because this car is from 2019 and from Europe, so even though you got those features in America, you did not get them here in Europe until recently. If you buy a new car now, a new LC500, you will get many of those services. I did not, I cannot review them because they are not here and the apps never worked. Alexa, same thing, doesn't work, at least not here in Europe. One of the big problems with this blue navigation route is that it gets extremely convoluted when it's rerouting because it will just be a huge blue mess on top of itself. One thing that is really odd with this system is that there's three places you can change the language. So, I can choose the language in the gate cluster. It is separate from the two languages that you see over here. I can do language that is all the text and I can do voice recognition language for itself as well. Why is this not just one thing so that if you're German, everything is German? Like if a German person is going to drive this car, they have to go in here and say, okay, I want to find German here in this list where I'm flicking up and down. If they don't know about that, they have to, well, they can't go up, they have to use the list over here. So if they're a German person, they have to find Deutsch here, okay, and then they have to say Ich spreche für Erkennung here, they have to say, okay, I'm German, I have to find German here as well, and now the whole system is speaking German. Voice recognition is generally really, really bad. There are only very few options that you can do for voice recognition in this car, so like uh, you can always of course, tell it your address. Destination 30. Bernhard von Weimar Straße, Fürth. So that is where I live. Let's Spell see. the name of the city. <laughs> Come on. F U umlaut. Select a line number <coughs> or say correction. 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 Spell the name of the city. F U R T H. Now it doesn't Select know about the number. umlaut. Or say correction. Two. Line so two. I can't really say U umlaut. Perth. Select a line number. Or say correction. Two. Line two. Perth. Stat. Spell the name of the street. B E R N H A R D dash. Pardon. B E R N H A R D. Say, for example, P I C C A. Okay. B I C C A. <laughs> B8. No. Say the house number. No, 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 that, that's not a, that's not a street. Cancel. Pardon? Cancel. Cancel. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I've had so many passengers trying to use this system, trying to enter a um, a destination in different languages and it just never ever works. It's incredibly bad and since that doesn't work very well and typing in street name and so on doesn't work very well, it's just really difficult to use the navigation and that is a shame. Lexus has tried to do something right, like the uh, you are able to put in your favorites and it also has auto navigation, like if I'm turning the car on now it will try to also navigate home because it thinks I'm getting home from work. That works, but really everything else should be working as well. And one thing again, in, in this navigation system, these colors are really ugly. If you look at the navigation system from competitors, especially BMW, the colors they use are beautiful. And I think the colors used when you're going into night mode, 
tricking the car into thinking yeah now I'm holding my hand over the sensor this is this looks okay but day mode it's uh, the the colors are not pretty and that is a shame because everything else in this car is gorgeous and one thing about this navigation when I'm driving is that I have my hand on the steering wheel which means I'm blocking this part of the navigation so I can't see the street number I can't see the next thing that is coming up in the big screen and that's pretty stupid I want to be able to glance at that but my hand is in the way when I'm driving another issue we have is that pop-ups they disappear too quickly if you're not reacting to it. It should be so that when you're having a pop-up on the screen, then you should be able to interact with it when it detects that you're actually on the touchpad. Pop-ups for ghost drivers appear quite often in this system. I do not know why I think it's an error because it shows ghost drivers warnings for that much more often than they actually appear. Sometimes this system dies. In order to reset the navigation, you have to hold down the power button for three seconds and then it resets and that is just annoying. When driving the car I enjoy to have the highway screen on the right hand side but there is this problem sometimes the car doesn't know that we are on the highway or the autobahn as it's called here in Germany and that means it changes away from the screen. Now when it changes away it kind of forgets that it has to go back to the screen which means that you always have to click this top right button up here in order to get it back once it is forgotten. It does happen sometimes at random when the map doesn't know that you're on the highway and it almost always happens or rather and it always happens when you're deviating from the highway. As an example let's go to the uh, stop over here in 500 meters. So now I got highway on the right hand side. We're going to go to the bathroom or something here but then you can see it changes away any moment now there we go As you can see, the screen does not turn back into highway mode. And check this out. This is the rear camera. That is extremely poor quality. I don't know why in a 100,000 euro car they put in such a bad camera, but they did. And that is just a shame. It's, uh, it should be much, much better. The last item I have on my list here is also not something that is going to annoy that many people, but sometimes it doesn't read usb correctly and it just mixes up all songs in all folders in one big folder so i'm just listening to random songs as if i had everything in the same folder that is really odd okay it's time for a conclusion is this infotainment system broken beyond repair i hope that you can get to your own conclusion by just watching this video my answer is Yes and no. What you've seen in this video are mostly software issues. The software issues can be fixed <laughs> and Lexus is actually updating the system. When you get it in for service, they update the system. When they sell the new versions, you get new features in the infotainment system. As an example, if you buy an LC500 now, then you actually do get Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. Unfortunately, a lot of the software issues will not be fixed by Lexus. They already moved on to a new touchscreen based system. It won't really work here in the LC500, unfortunately, which is why I will say I don't see this system getting fixed and it is definitely bad, but we already knew that. So that's it for this video. If you enjoyed this video, and would like to see more car content, then uh, it's a bit disappointing because this is a Lego channel. However, I do have videos where I'm building Lego models of real cars, including a video where I have built this LC500. And I typically make building instructions for those cars so that you can build them yourself. And I've got a lot of race cars. I'm going to link a full playlist here in this video. And thank you for watching. Take care, have fun, and maybe I'll see you another time.